Hello and welcome to the Detoxicity Podcast. I am Mike Joseph. I produce and host and created this show. I thank you for listening. Uh, if you are new to this podcast, if this is your first time listening, welcome aboard. If you are a regular listener of this podcast, I thank you for hanging in and sticking with us uh, through the last year and a half or so. Um, it is really my distinct pleasure to bring you these conversations. I find them illuminating even as a listener and not just the host. If you are interested in exploring this podcast any further, feel free to A, hit the uh, uh, subscribe button on whichever platform you're using to listen. Also, please feel free to vote us up on those podcast platforms so we appear near the top of the search and uh, move up in the rankings. And uh, by all means, give us a rating if you like the show, if you hate the show, if you feel somehow conflicted about the show, uh, please rate, subscribe and comment. You can follow me on Instagram at DetoxPodGuy, and you can follow me on Twitter at TizMikeJoseph. You can even drop me a line via old-fashioned email, DetoxPod at gmail.com. Also, feel free to reach out via email if you know somebody that would be a good fit for this show, or if you yourself would be interested in talking to me for an episode of this show. Once again, I really, really appreciate you listening. I think these are important messages that we're sending. These are important stories we're telling, and uh, I hope this all continues. Once again, you are appreciated. I hope that you and yours are taken care. Since I started doing this show, I've developed a bit of a thing about people who call themselves life coaches. There's a level of, dare I say, bullshit that I've detected with some of the people I've interviewed thus far that have felt the calling to coach others through life. So I approached my interview with this week's guest, Ethan Frankleton, cautiously. Thankfully, Ethan allayed my fears by being vulnerable, being honest, and acknowledging that he doesn't come from a place of presumed superiority or enlightenment. He's fighting the good fight just like the rest of us. He's trying to help others through a combination of his own experience and the knowledge that there is still quite a journey ahead. I should also add that Ethan, like many of my guests, is a lot of things in addition to being a life coach. What is it with people and their being multifaceted? It's shocking. Uh, anyway, he is a musician, he is an author, and he is the host of the podcast, The Fearless Storyteller. Uh, during our conversation, Ethan and I talked quite a bit about the life circumstances that have led to him being uniquely qualified to help others. Uh, we converse about being brought up in diverse backgrounds and how that allows people to develop empathy towards others not like them. Uh, we talk about grind culture and how that ultimately only benefits a small number of people in high places. Guess what, y'all? Most likely it's not you. And there's a whole lot more we discuss if you listen through. So without further ado, here's Ethan. My name is Ethan Freckleton. I live in Bellingham, Washington. I've worn a number of labels over the year, but actively I write books for the most part and occasionally coach people who, who are asking for help. And you've done a lot of things in addition to that. You are a musician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a good focused 10-year run at getting better at a lot of things around music. And some of that was the craft of writing songs. And some of that was playing my instrument. Some of that was learning how to sing, actually, which was, you know, nice. Right. Some of that's making all the music connections in the business. And, and boy, it is an endless anthill the music business. <laughs> yes, it definitely is. How did you fall into any of the stuff that you do? How did you fall into writing? How did you fall into mm. the coaching? Uh, were these things always a passion of yours? Or was it just sort of like a circuitous a series of events yeah, that, that led to one uh, thing or another? <laughs> circuitous is likely, I think. So first of all, my dad is was a musician and before we really got launched when I was a child, he was a bass player down in Los Angeles. And then he got into the Navy and we traveled around, but he always kept playing. And then eventually he put down roots again and played a lot of music again. So I've got that in the backdrop. And my mom is more of a visual arts person. Okay. So I always had, had that sense of ingrained of a creative streak for sure. I think writing books of the things that of the labels I've worn is probably the one thing that I would have least 
told you 20 years ago that I'd be doing? Yeah. Well, is it a, I never pictured my name on a book kind of thing, or is it an, an I, what didn't see myself as a writer? I, kind of I grew up, so my mom had like probably thousands of science fiction and fantasy books on her bookshelf, which a lot of those made the move every time we'd move with our Navy moves, which I suppose was easier because the Navy paid for your shipping. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Navy, for preserving, <laughs> preserving the family library. <laughs> and for, you know, uh, probably contributing to the strength of your back not falling apart from moving yeah, all over the place. Right, right. So I always enjoyed books and I did as a teen buy books on how to write or how to do science fiction and fantasy and it honestly it just seemed like a lot of work there were a lot of pieces that I didn't understand that I would have to and it seemed like there was a really high bar for writing like there was a lot of you know everything involved doing it right I think that was the biggest element I picked up there were gatekeepers there was something you had to do right you had to put hundreds of hours into it. And it, that just seems like a lot of commitment to somebody who's a young person and just trying to figure out everything about life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I can, I guess, see that it, it must, particularly if you're of a certain age before you could mm -hmm. just sign up for an Amazon account and publish your own book. Right. It, it was a lot more daunting. Right. Uh, Pre-internet. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I, I am old enough to be, you know, to have been before and after the internet, for right. sure. Right. So of your many hats, of your many roles, mm -hmm. what are the ones that you are most proud of? What well, I'm proud that I can say, separate my hats from my identity. Uh, how's that one for being yeah. proud? They intersect for so many people. And I'm not going to say whether they should or shouldn't. I think that's up to mm -hmm. the individual. Yeah. But that's an important delineation to make. Like, yeah. you, and, and, and of those hats, you know, I think the one that I won't ever be able to put away is, is parent, right? And definitely I'm proud of that. Yeah, I've got two children. One's all grown up and, and one's very much not. <laughs> okay. See, I'm not a parent, so I, I like hearing stories about how parenting changes people. And the thing that I hear the most often is parenting causes you to be less self-absorbed is, is, <laughs> is that true yeah is it true for you for whether me, it's universally it, true it's true for me in the sense that i have learned to because i think there's almost nothing more difficult in the practical day-to-day -day of most people's lives than balancing finding balance in a situation when you're a parent or a co-parent and you've got a family because you've got to figure out okay how do I have time and energy for what I must do how do I have time and energy for what um, I want to do how do I make time and energy to show up for other people on a daily basis right and how does everybody else has those same needs right in the family so so figuring out how everybody feels some contentment in that situation and the child is emotionally healthy right like that's asking a lot of somebody it really is and it's something we volunteer for right like i signed up for that the first time i was a young parent i was like 23 first child and i just jumped right in there you know and like in not well not necessarily yeah. well but the best i could with the skills you know so in retrospect it seems so crazy to me that like people under the age of 30 have kids because mm -hmm. i not that there's any particular time when you automatically mature and you become or, or emotionally mature and it's yeah. like you can be a good parent but i think of myself at 21 22 25 mm -hmm. and i'm like wow imagine if i had brought a child into this world how would i even been able to handle that and some people do it well 
but just knowing my mental state and my relative lack of maturity, just the, the ability to do that and the ability to put my focus into another human being to that mm -hmm. level, the level yeah. of responsibility. I just don't think it would have. Uh... Well, you know, you know, Mike, I, we're here in 2021 still by some miracle. <laughs> we and, are. And I, I suspect the truth is, you know, a little more simple, which is we just kind of do it and know how to do it, whether we do it well or not. Right. Like when it happens, it's a fact and we're very good at making do with immediate facts in our right. life. Right. And I think the way I grew up, I don't think I ever had, like, you'll hear people say like, I didn't know that being an author was a reality that was attainable for me unless I had some people who were authors in my life, or I didn't know that being a professional musician was a reality unless I had people who were professional musicians in my reality. So I had musicians in my reality growing up. So I knew that was a thing. I didn't have anybody who was writing books. I knew plain people who said they wished they could, right? And with parenting or responsibility, like everybody, like in my circle, like, just had responsibility and even myself from a pretty young age just had responsibility so by the time I had a child I it never occurred to me Mike that I could have all the time in the day for myself it's, it, at that age it sure. was it wasn't and it took me most of my 20s maybe all of it to figure out how to create anything even close to that I get that. I, it's interesting. I, I can relate to the growing up, not feeling like I had any time for myself or not mm. feeling like I had enough time for myself. I had mm. some, but circumstances led to me sort of being put in a uh, sort of an advisory or, or almost sort of like parenting or caretaking role mm -hmm. uh, pretty early in life. And I think once I got to a point where I had the time to myself and I could devote time to myself, I was like, I'm going to be selfish. I don't want to give this to anybody mm -hmm. else. So I, mm -hmm. I guess in that case, it's, it's more of a conscious decision than it is a, uh, you know, just kind of happenstance. Yeah. Well, it was the second time around. It was very much a conscious decision. I knew exactly what I was getting into and what sure. I was giving up at that point. Sure. Yeah. As a coach, I'm always interested in talking to people who, who do coaching mm. because uh, I can't quantify exactly why. I don't know. I almost feel like there's a kind of hierarchical structure there. Yeah. I'm curious about two things. One is what do you see as the value that you bring into this dynamic? And the other thing is, what are some common issues that people come to you with? I have a lot of complex feelings about the world of coaching and the label of coaching and how it is perceived and how it's executed. But at the heart of it is a really like valuable thing. And, and that's the idea of having somebody trained to actively listen to you for an hour and to make space for you for an hour of time at a time or more right and to develop that relationship where that person who's trained to actively listen to you and to set aside their own agenda their own ego their own need to fix you or fix anything for you they're setting all that aside to just listen take notes and act and ask questions that come up, right? To reflect back understanding and to give somebody space to think about something maybe they haven't thought of before and to find their own answers. That's worth a lot. And, and that's why I got into coaching. And that's a skill that I'm proud to say I had some of before I did the training for it. And then over a six month period of doing full weekends at a time to practice and get techniques, I learned how to be a great active listener. And that's beneficial in coaching and that's beneficial in life as well. So that's what it offers 
for, to answer that question. And my favorite thing about it, this might sound a little snarky and it is, but nowhere did that training make me an expert on vaccines or non-fungible tokens or how to be more attractive or how to solve problems for any number of things, right? But you have to solve problems related to beauty, well-being or something in order to just market the profession of being a coach. <laughs> and that part I have a huge problem with. And I haven't figured out how to, to do it at scale without dipping into that world of needing credibility and being an expert. Sure. So what ends up happening is I get clients who through this happenstance of life appreciate who I, how I am and trust me to hold their story, right? There's something about me that makes them trust me and to give themselves that permission to step into my space and you've work got, with me. You've, you've got trustworthy voice, Ethan. You've got- Thank you. Yes. And I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of what I was going for. Previous coaches that I have spoken to, even for this show, Hmm. have come across as experts. And I, I don't hmm. know that I believe, no one knows everything about anything. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And in my experience with therapists and in with, well, I expect my medical doctors to be experts, but in every other hierarchical structure in my life, hmm. I don't want people to be experts. I want people to be knowledgeable of the fact that they're not experts, but also be confident that they have the tools to help anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine in there is the ability to listen and to surface what problem solving and then to have some sort of craft involved in finding answers, right? Or, right. Or in creating resources, right? Like you, a lot of what doctors do and other people do is they have these networks of experts right. who, who are verifiably experts because they've worked really hard and they have craft that they've learned and, and they know when to say, I don't know, or know when to say this is inconclusive, would you like my best guess? Right. I, I respect in people the ability to say, I'm not sure. Mm. or this is subjective, or I think this will work, but I'm not sure it'll work for you. Yeah. It's the ability to add those qualifiers at the end of, of, of definitive or declarative yes. statements. And if you're searching for a coach, those are the things to be look, listening for. Absolutely. Okay. Not, you know, well, I, I can't say what works for everybody who works with other coaches either, you know, right? right? You can only speak right. to my own experiences and people I've experienced. So do you have a specialty in terms of people that you do coach or? I have, I have a couple niches. One is pretty broad and it's just kind of more my framework for how I've dealt with things. And that's helping people through unexpected transitions, maybe leverage that as a time to take advantages of the gifts that come with an unexpected transition, because often there's a lot of choices and side effects that come with unexpected transitions. And a lot of times like a divorce at the end of a relationship or getting laid off from a job, right? There's um, a lot that you lose in that, but you also lose a lot of the weight of choices you've made previously. And you have right the capacity to say, hey, what am I actually going for? And to maybe start creating space for that, that when you may move forward and replace that job or replace that relationship or whatever it is to say, hey, I'm also going to include these other things that I haven't been able to accommodate before. And so I wrote a book about that that kind of captured my process. And a lot of it's just self-coaching fundamentals, but it's packaged for people who are in an unexpected transition. So that's one niche where people find me. And the other is for people who go, oh yeah, you know, Ethan's done all this music shit and he's done all this writing stuff. 
you notice how I said shit for one and, and stuff, stuff the for other. the other. Hey. I, just, I just noticed that. What's hey. going on there? But you know, people are like, hey, I wish I was doing that. Or I wish I was making time for my creativity. And I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to talk to Ethan. And sometimes I get clients who are doing it. And for some reason, it's not working for them and they're not finding joy in it. I've had those clients too. Six-figure authors and other people who doing great, but hating it. Yeah. I, that, that happens too. Even the best of them. I, I must imagine that everybody who does something creative, as sexy as it may seem to people who are not creative, gets to a certain point where they're like, eh, maybe this wasn't what I signed up for. Or the really difficult thing to confront sometimes is I don't feel like doing this anymore. Like I've been doing yeah. this my whole life. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. That's a scary thing to say. I don't feel yeah. like doing this anymore. I'm lucky enough to have felt that way a few times now <laughs> and, and to feel like I've come out on the other side of that. Or maybe it can just be enough to say, I, I don't want to do this anymore right now. Right. I don't have to decide how it's going to look 20 years from now. I can just say, I'm going to put this down and do something else. Were you always this measured and calm and thoughtful? <laughs> yes, but probably for different reasons early on. Okay. Um, I'm often, yeah, I like to think about things. Maybe it's a side effect of being an introvert and, and not wanting to say the wrong thing. That would have been an early thing, but... A lot of times I defaulted to the role of being a listener and maybe that was as a coping mechanism. I don't know. Also because I'm an only child. I didn't grow up with a lot of competition for my mental space. You know? The mysterious only child, a thing that I the, can't even fathom. You, yes. Yes. And it'll always be mysterious for me, somebody who's not, right? You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> I feel like for a lot of people, I think, to get to the point where they have reached, for lack of a better term, sense of Zen, mm. takes going through some difficult shit and mm. waiting your way through it. Yeah, I reckon um, so. Yeah. I, I, I know people have gone through different difficult shit and keep recreating it and people who, who create something better out of it. I, I think that the universal truth there is everybody ends up going through difficult shit that is probably true yeah. that is probably true <laughs> um talking about you grew up in washington or california or um some... i was born in los angeles my parents met down in los angeles they spent most of my childhood and probably before then figuring out ways to be as far away from their parents as possible. And so part of that ended up being my dad was, went into the Navy. Right. And I became a Navy brat for a few years. Yeah. How many different places did you bounce around to? Not a ton, but the cool part was the road trips. I'm addicted to road trips now because we do these big cross-country moves and, and get to see things. And that was fun. Uh, you know, he was only in for six years. Okay. Um, and because I guess my parents' counterculture roots led to my dad couldn't handle another six years of being told what to do all the time. You know, go figure. <laughs> I don't know if I could handle six weeks of that. So I get it. Yeah. The most interesting place ended up was Newfoundland. Half of those six years was spent in Newfoundland, which is quite a place to live as a child. I would so. imagine. Yeah, lots of good outdoor time. <laughs> <laughs> but the road trip thing, I, I don't know. I mean, I enjoy traveling, but I think as much as I enjoy traveling, I like, I like sleeping in the same bed every night. And the comfort mm. of knowing when I look out the window, it's going to be the same view. I, I waffle back mm. and forth on how I feel about that. Yeah, and maybe it's both can be true. You know? Yeah. yeah I, I suspect, like, for me, uh, the need for novelty is an important driving force, and whether that's environmental or otherwise, it's a big thing. Right. Like, travel right. shakes things up. You don't have your daily routine. You're leaving your daily routine behind, and sometimes that's not comforting, and sometimes it's great. 
to get away from the rut maybe you're in. You know? Right, right, yeah. absolutely. So here's the thing. I've been to LA a few times. Mm. I've spent in different parts of California. And as a native New Yorker, as someone mm. who's always lived Northeast, a little mm-hmm. bit of Midwest, the temperament of California or LA versus New York, Boston, Philly kind of thing. It feels like I could never live in LA because everyone there is so relaxed. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't think I'd be able to dial myself down enough to feel comfortable. I'm wondering if that level of intensity versus presumed lack of intensity is something that yeah. you've noticed that you ever deal with or like, and obviously I can't help it. I have definite West Coast vibe and I did spend some time in the East Coast and, and I did a lot of traveling for music stuff, particularly. And I noticed for those areas that I travel, there's that brash New York thing for sure. And maybe that has roots that goes all the way back to the founding of this country, right? And there is a brashness required to expand one's footprint so aggressively and yeah. to get things done. And LA is kind of a logical conclusion of that. It ran out of land. There was nowhere else to go. It's like, well, fuck it. I guess we're done. Right. I'm just going to no chill. More, no more people at this place. No more land to claim. This is as far as I can go. <laughs> you, know? you know, that never occurred to me. But you might be onto something. I mean, I, I, it could be a, a space thing. It could be a weather thing. I mean, it's very likely some combination of a whole bunch of different things. I, I find different vibes of people that are like, so like from a music thing, right? Like there's New York and Los Angeles are important, but then there, there's also Nashville, which is in the Southeast. And then my favorite to go to is always Hawaii. You know, I, I did a lot of music stuff there and first of all i say like you talk about new york and la being the dichotomy for me it's like the rest of the u.s and the southeast is the dichotomy for me okay because people can be so friendly and folksy and cheerful just honest and talking about religion and race and those things and yet still being maybe shitty (laughs) to people but it's a totally different vibe you know hawaii is a whole other thing right yeah that's a yeah. whole other thing yeah i don't know I, I i see even northeast southeast there's there's you know in, in northeast well that's not true because there is folksiness if you go into like new england if you're in maine or vermont or something mm. like that you'll see that but there's a sense of the no bullshit isn't like couched in niceness necessarily yeah it's not an accent that says you know you can say fuck you you can say have a nice day and they mean they'll mean the exact same thing right and i feel like the southeast is have a nice day and the northeast is fuck you yeah well yeah i <laughs> I, I see that yeah. <laughs> and and the west coast is it that's all so foreign that it just stands out either way right right you know. right yeah <laughs> it's, it's 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 interesting to me just how different parts of this country can express the same sentiment in so many different Mm. and at times opposing well in seattle which i'm north of seattle now but i spent a lot of years in the seattle orbit has its own reputation which for people who move to seattle hear about constantly which is the seattle chill yes i don't don't know if you've ever heard of that i have yeah. yeah and and so i think that's why it's a dichotomy for me people just kind of avoid social contact even in big groups right where you go somewhere like the southeast and it's like wait a minute people are curious about me all the time and willing to to engage you know i i have not personally experienced the seattle chill i've been to seattle a number of times and i i love that city quite a bit but whenever i've been there it's been with other out of towners so i Mm -hmm. it's not like i've really been uh anywhere in seattle and and had the experience of, oh, let me mingle with the locals. Mm. It's always been with other folks who were yeah. exploring the same way I was. Yeah. And I'm not an expert on uh, that, but yeah. You know, sure. I, just something to shrug at. Yeah. So as you get older, what are things that really stick out as 
being important to you, whether in terms of personal growth, in terms of societal growth, however you want to want to spin that? Well, some things. I think, I think it's an, an inevitable that when you're younger, you are taking on and using the stories others give you as your tools to engage with the world and figure it out. And by the time you're my age, those tools don't work on their own anymore. You need your own stories and how you cope with that, you know, is up to the individual. For me, leading up to it was, I just wanted to understand and I wanted to search and I wanted to question assumptions and, and it's a pet peeve for me when people don't question assumptions and and it seems like this term that, that's in vogue again, white supremacy. I wonder if, because growing up, I grew up in a very white centric for the most part. My dad engaged with more diversity just as a fact of the music and everything else he did. But I interpret white supremacy as laziness and medio mediocrity and a need to feel good about myself above all else. And that's built on a pile of things, assumptions or mythologies. And that's one of the things, right? Like we create these mythologies as a way to communicate in a shortcut and it's a way for us to have shared values and shared narrative. Like if we didn't have the mythology of the United States, if we didn't have the mythology that the economy comes first and economic growth is important, what would unify us? It's those myths, yeah. right, that bring us together. And other myths that get formed are criminal justice, right, or mass incarceration, right? What happens, this idea that there's an idea, we try it out, it doesn't work, but then we'd have to talk about why it's not working. Instead, it would be more convenient to say, hey, we found the solution already. We just keep moving forward with it. And maybe for another 120, 170 years until it's grown into a myth. But it's one that can't be questioned in polite company or in polite society. And if you do start to unpack it, then you have to deal with somebody else's reaction. Who's like, why would they question something that's been true for 170 years? I feel like that's where the conversation is on so many things and, and why it's important to me. It's stuff like that that's kept me being an only child in the world. It's kept me from feeling authentic connection with people and, it, and right, that have to work so hard to unpack all this shit just to be able to show up without assumptions and to learn. And it's frustrating to not see other people um, trying. You bring up a really interesting point. Actually, as you're talking, four questions formed in my head and I can only remember the last one. <laughs> one theory that I've had, and, and I've not really discussed this with anybody before, is people stay in their silo. Um, because when you engage with people outside of your silo, it's a lot of work to maybe step out of yourself and see their viewpoint. So it's why people stay in their hometowns. Yeah. It's why outside maybe of some bigger cities, you don't see large adult groups of people that are racially or culturally or sexually diverse. And I feel like the big roadblock or a big roadblock in people being able to understand one another and empathize is just having a goddamn conversation just yeah. saying hey i'm going to confront some uncomfortable shit and i realize that in order to be friends with you as a woman or as someone of latin descent or asian descent or someone who's black or someone who's Gay, I'm going to have to step out of myself and imagine what life might be like for you and how that is different from what I go through. Yeah. And people yeah. are so afraid to take that step. And I don't know if it's 
ignorance or a fear of saying the wrong thing or just fear yeah. of having your mindset changed or, or what it is. I, I don't know. Well, yeah, it's tough to ch- talk in generalizations, but I think a large part of it is, I, let's say your re- reality forces you to go into other situations, right? Or maybe you've created a reality where you're able to do that. Maybe you travel, you go overseas, you live somewhere, and you're in the military, whatever you do. You're not trying to change your mindset, but you're immersed in something that's novel to you. And you're going to be for You're going to have observations. You're going to share context that's different from where you were with other people. And you're just going to pick things up that you might not even be able to verbalize, right? But that takes time to do something. It takes time. And to turn this into you know, author metaphor, everybody wants to know how to have more time without sacrificing their money and what they've got. How do I have more time? The four hour work week, whatever it is, people feel like they don't have the time to shake things up doing. And I was talking about balance, right? Finding balance in a family. Where do I find balance? Let's say that I want to change. I want to broaden my perspective. Where do I find the time? My family life, I'm working, I'm hustling, doing all the things. How do I do that? I can't do it within my silo, but that's the thing we get. We walk in so readily because of the tools we have at an early age to function and fit into society and to get a job and to take on credit cards and all these things, we get locked in so fast before we even have our own ideas and stories about the world. And I think that's a large part of it is just people are kind of in this molasses of wherever they are, right? And one way I think I benefited from bypassing it, you know, one traveling by nature of growing up a Navy brat, but two, it's just being a voracious reader. There's no way to avoid developing empathy for other people and other perspectives and other experiences. And it's probably the biggest shortcut for, for just being open-minded, right? How valuable is that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, whether it, through art, whether it, it's yeah. reading or television or, or music, to be able to develop a critical lens and an empathetic lens. Mm -hmm. And I I really do think that critical thinking and empathy are the two things that are necessary towards, not to oversimplify it, but to A, making the world a better place and and just living, not to be Oprah, but to live like a fuller life, a more complete life. Yeah, but now, so if I live somewhere rural, it could be anywhere. It could be in the Midwest, wherever. What, what do I have access to? And how many people read for pleasure in this country? Not many. That's right. Like 30%. It's not be, and that's for a variety of reasons, I'm sure. But it's not because they set out to say, hey, I'm going to live in my silo. I'm going to hate you. You know, it's like, no, it's not important and I don't have time. Hmm. Right. Is and it's there, not fun because right. for some reason in my childhood, it wasn't fun, you know? Yeah, I, I wonder if there's a turnkey solution to get people to, to figure out, like, you know, to pull it back. Net, I, you know, Netflix yeah. has the solution. People like Netflix have the solution. They, But because they're focused on an engagement, they're not going to do it. So do you, I don't know, you have like Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu I, or any of that stuff? I have all of those. Okay, things. so my favorite part, Mike, of traveling or going to a friend's house or a and b is loading up Netflix. Because, well, this isn't really my favorite part, but <laughs> I, it, it's stimulating for me. So if I load up my Netflix, I'm going to see what I see. I could spend hours scrolling it. I'm going to see the same damn things. And trying to find something new that sticks out to me is almost impossible. I've got years of Netflix history built up. Sure. If I boot up somebody else's profile, 
I don't see any of the same stuff except for maybe the suggested top 10. Right. What said it, what, what it says people is hot and trending aren't even the same shows, right? It's like, really different. You want, like the, the shortcut is if every day or every week you just had your profile wiped and you saw everything, because as soon as you watch one thing, it changes all your recommendations and suddenly it's not fraud and interesting and diverse anymore. Suddenly it's all tailored to the one thing you watched. I mean, I worked in tech. That's one of the hats I wore, Mike. I worked at Microsoft. I worked in startups, right? Like that phenomena is happening on all the services we're consuming and therefore none of us are seeing and consuming some more material to have a dialogue about objectively i know that yeah but from a subjective standpoint it really didn't occur to me until you just yeah. mentioned it and we're spending you know so culturally where we are you know we're a first world country we spend a lot of time on facebook instagram netflix whatever it's curated content meaning it's been focus to you. Absolutely. And one of the reasons I quit Facebook, I'm close to quitting Instagram because it's owned by Facebook. It, it don't, doesn't show me the people I follow. Sure. Because it's already decided how to curate. And for those services, unlike Netflix, I can't reset my profile. Right. Yeah. And so I can't have the experience I want. Curiosity hmm. is such a wonderful thing. And I don't hear about that as often as I'd yeah. like to from the people that I speak to. Yeah. Well, for me, it's, it's a selfish reason. I'm 40 something, mid forties, and I'm just bored. I'm just bored, Mike. I'm <laughs> bored of reading the same stories. I'm bored of seeing the same shows. I know how they're gonna go. I know where the formula is going. I've got the craft. I just don't give a shit. And if I turn off the algorithm and reset my profile, maybe I get lucky and I see something captivating and interesting and novel new to me that's going to surprise me. And that's where joy comes from. It's in the surprise. Is it, is it curiosity or is it boredom? I don't know. Can it be a little of column A, a little of column B? I think, yeah, I think they go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, the wheels in my head are turning. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so interesting to me that we do, unless we're conscious of it ourselves or unless we're kicked in the ass by someone that is near and dear to us or whether someone comes into our life that kind of shakes us up a little bit, we're spinning wheels. And that's my favorite thing about podcasts, not the apps necessarily, but podcasts, as long as they still have a search feature that doesn't work like Google, I'm happy because I could type in a keyword, I'm going to find something different. And that's, that's why I started listening to podcasts. I don't pay attention to the recommendations because this is going to give me more of what I search for. That's not what I'm looking for. You know, I generally have a hard time with recommendations just because I feel like my tastes are so all over the place that no yeah. algorithm is ever going to be able to give me what it is that I want. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is not enough. Well, they probably have the data to do it, you know, in aggregate. So uh, look out. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just, in, <laughs> in my head, I'd like to think that I break, I break the algorithm. Yeah, that's I, great. I break the data. Well, I, again, we're not, we're not meant to be that, you know. That's probably yeah. me just thinking too highly of myself. Maybe. No, that's great. I'm glad you do. And I appreciate that, like, your eclectic tastes are intact. And, uh, maybe not as eclectic as I would like them to be, but I, I'd like to think that I, I am appreciative of most things, even mm. if I have my favorites, I'd like to think that I stay fairly open-minded. See, I didn't grow up being appreciative of all things. I grew up thinking that the things that my parents liked and what they said was good was good. I had a false equivocation with what I'm into, what my taste is what's mm. good. Right. And that what I'm not into is not good. Right. It's shit. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's kind of like an indie thing, like that indie rock. My dad was maybe a little indie. My parents, you know, the counterculture thing. You know, like, well, if it's popular, it sucks. It's right? crappy. Right. If it's not made by black people, it sucks. Like my dad's huge into worshiping like blues and jazz. And for him, that was true north. And for him, everything derived from from the blues, even if it didn't. <laughs> Can the same thing's true with reading fiction and stuff. I, I still struggle. It's a skill. I have to be in my higher place to appreciate the things I don't like. I So I admire that and you that you're able to have such diverse tastes. And, and for me, that was never a choice. Sure. Yeah. I, I think that may come from culturally, even as a kid, having a place in many different parts of my world. When I came home, my culture was a very specific thing. When I went to school, culture was something else. And my culture at school and culture at home were different mm -hmm. from each other. And then moving around a little bit, as you mentioned before, and being in these different environments, I think that was a factor in it. And just, again, being placed in situations where you're around people who are not necessarily like you, but mm -hmm. you don't have any animosity. You just try to soak yeah. up, or just trying to fit into every single box you can try to fit in too. Yeah, I get that. And yeah, the product of environment and, yeah. and, and all those things. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I wouldn't have liked as a kid that I could come back to now and say, hey, you know, I can appreciate something about this. Yeah. You know, which, which is cool. Yeah. yeah, like I just, this just really just came into my head. When I was a little kid, so I was a teenager, I did not like pizza for some reason. Mid 40s, me now is like, you didn't like pizza? What the hell? Yeah. Uh, but there's, it, it, you have to step out of, it's, you know, a long winded way of saying stepping out of your comfort zone sometimes and maybe even sometimes being pushed outside of your comfort zone can yeah. turn out to be extremely rewarding. Yeah, yeah. And, life circumstances can do that too yeah you don't get to choose always right yeah and when you do that's pretty cool it absolutely is speaking in terms of masculinity you, you mm -hmm. seem like a fairly evolved uh, gentleman <laughs> I, I don't think i've talked to too many like absolute lunkheads uh, as part of the show what yeah. has been the hardest thing in terms of ethan evolving as a man uh what has been sort of the hardest thing to get over because it does seem like you're in touch with your feelings you're pretty open mind you are receptive to change and receptive mm. to things that are different from you all of the immediately toxic barriers you seem yeah. to have jumped yeah. those hurdles yeah yeah there's a few questions in there i heard I, i'm sure that some of the credit goes to my parents Right. I had some luck factors in, in there. They had rejected parts of their cultures and they intentionally stepping away from the safety of their family and deciding to be black sheep and, and do their own thing. Right. And there was no religion in my life growing. Well, there, there was, but it, it, for funny reasons. But <laughs> okay. Like, well, uh, to do a brief detour here. So like, as a kid maybe five or six living on a navy base in the middle of nowhere and there's one church because it's on the navy base right and it's the reagan years everybody seems to go to church or everybody wants to know what's your religion are you catholic are you baptist are you protestant kids ask each other that really early all the rude questions mm -hmm. my parents would tell me well just say you're protestant so that's what I would say. That meant. People would leave me alone after I said that. But the only child care on the base was to send your kids to Sunday school. So I went to Sunday school. <laughs> and it turned out it was a Catholic service. And I'd do the, the bread and the wine and, the wine. and, and do the, the stories. And boy, I got really confused from that. I bet. Because <laughs> they were just sending me for child care. They, right. You know. I didn't give a shit. I didn't give a shit. Yeah. So some of it is I I was always felt like another, and I think a lot of people do, 
growing up, but for me, it was amplified by moving a lot. And then when we settled down, we settled down in a suburb that was really money and we didn't have any. And so to kids that made it pretty obvious I was other. So I didn't just get this, I was on the defensive growing up about myself a lot of the time. And I think I found ways to cope and connect by being available and non-judgmental and just picking up the relationships that I could, right? You know, people that wanted to hang out, being accepting and open. And part of the stories I would get growing up, I was blind to all the things that come with the typical Christian US culture patriarchy yeah. thing, because I didn't have that in my immediate family circle. Lucky man. And I, yeah, I, I can agree, but I didn't understand why girls didn't ever show or signal that they were into me. I didn't understand why everything had to be military when I'd engage in sports, right? Yeah. Um, it felt outside of my system and my values, so I didn't engage a lot with that. So I, I felt other, other than, right? And because everybody went to different churches, so I'm just here on the sidelines, right? And I'm an only child, right? right? And so I don't know if there was a conscious choice, but other than just by coping to be open to connecting with whoever I could, yeah that's that's the roots of it and then along the way i have experiences i learn how to be an active listener i'm curious so i'm learning about like when i was early in my software career i didn't understand why bad decisions were made all the time or why things i didn't understand and i was on the front lines and i worked with people who valued logic and so no one could understand why these decisions would get made and i go back to school and get training and and learn how to climb the ladder. And that's where I learned where decisions are made. It was not an easy trip. I got into the point where I was in meetings with general managers and vice presidents and, and seeing the machine running. And there's a book called The Utopia of Rules okay. um, by Michael Graber, who's a sociologist and he studied the history of public and private bureaucracy. It's a very interesting book, but it gets at a truth that I observed, which is that there's very few people with decision-making power who actually get to be creative and make things up. And, and those are the people who are making decisions and their decisions are not based on logic reality. It's based on emotional reality. Okay. Which it turns out, I think almost universally, I think that's what we do. We make decisions that match our emotional reality. They're not measured on this idea of enlightened self-interest. We, we want to feel good about ourselves and make decisions that make us feel good about ourselves. And that's how business is done. And the other interesting thing that goes hand in hand with that is, so I'm sitting there, I'm working in this translation layer between made up bullshit and people who have to make something tangible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the people who are making up bullshit, their job is to make PowerPoint decks four times a year on a quarterly basis and make up metrics that they should be green, yellow, red on and oh, yeah. try to line up and translate their PowerPoint decks. They spend all their effort making sure that they're through the year, the language changes every year or two. What they're going to talk about is important. And then everybody has to figure out what those words mean because they don't mean anything. And then they have to make sure that all their PowerPoint decks are talking about the same thing. And that's what management's doing. And then somebody like me has to translate that and make and help, help people who are going to make the products believe that there's some semblance of order to it and that they're going to do something of value and that they're going to create the same, that they're all going to agree on what they're creating is the same thing and then do it in an organization where people at every level are being compared against each other for impact. So let's say you work as a team, like let's say sports 
kind of thing. You win X number of games and you lose Y number of games, right? It's objective when you lose. That's right. You do it as a team. Software is like that. And other bureau, it, it's when you're making something, there is an objective thing that comes out of it. And a group of people did it. And that's an impact. But you're doing it in a circumstance where there is a curve that's been put on it, where you're not rewarded as a team, you're rewarded as individuals. And this is America right here. So there is going to be, you take five people, this is the curve. One person's going to get 70% of the rewards out of the five. Three people are going to get virtually the same average thing. Well, two, one person's going to get below average and one person's going to get managed out. Okay. That pattern plays out in a team. Then it plays out in a group of teams working on the same thing. And then another thing, you keep bubbling up. The same thing is happening. So if there's five teams, one is getting managed out. One's going to get all the rewards. Two are going to get something. And it plays up the umbrella. And like... How would anything logical happen in that system? The logic is I want to keep my job and I want to get paid and I want to yep. get my bonus. Uh, like, and it mystifies me, but there's a choice. You get to have a choice because people are clear eyed at the top. And this is the real shit. Like, this is why I am unemployable at this point. <laughs> I, uh, unemployable because, because people at the top, they know. They know it's bullshit. They're stressing themselves out. They're killing themselves with stress over this competition. They're making money. They're getting their houses, getting their cars, they're putting their kids through college, whatever it is, right? And they know it. They know it's killing them. They hate it. They hate it. And they don't think there's any other way. It's just like the conversation we had about being an author. Right. In their, in their experience, there's just not another choice. So I'm just going to have to keep doing it. And I'll put in the time until I get my retirement package or whatever it is. And it was so depressing. Like It so is depressing, depressing because then it, what? Yeah. And so that was my choice. So I could play in the system and I could stress myself out and be unhappy and do the competition and make up bullshit for people. Right. And that would be where all my energy would go. Or I could figure out a way to step out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people are lucky enough to not go be in a corporation or a big bureaucracy. People could be school teachers. They got to work, stay at home, whatever they do. They work in construction and they don't understand how bureaucracies work. And so they celebrate the people at the top. They celebrate Donald Trump. They celebrate whoever it is. Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, they celebrate people and elect them into leaders when what you're doing is you're celebrating the people who recognize they're killing themselves and it's all a game and it's toxic. They know, they know. Yep. And that's what we celebrate because we don't, if you get, you have to be inside to see it. Yeah. I, I think once you realize the quote unquote game of it. Mm. If you're a little further down, and it also, I guess, depends on what your life goals are. Mm. You realize it's a game and then it's just kind of like, why am I doing this? Like, yeah. Wh yeah. Well, and so for, I had different stages, but the last time I, I did it, I did it clear eyed. I knew, and I did it with the understanding that I had some big music goals and that required capital. And I knew by that point, because of my unexpected transitions, I knew how to live on a lot less. This is like one of those fundamental life skills to figure out what's the least you can earn to get by. Sure. Because anything you get beyond that is your resources you have to invest in yourself and your personal growth or your dreams. And so by that point, I knew. I went back to Microsoft, I knew. and. I knew that half of my money I was bringing in, like a well, quarter realistically after taxes, was going to be for my music business. It was my investment capital. So that's why people do it, right? They have dreams. You need right. capital, you're buying time. 
That's what money does, right? It buys you time. But there's other ways to buy time. And this, <laughs> and, and this is community. It's family. It's multi-generational living. It's you don't need as much when you have more community and support. I don't community that num so yeah. much, so much. Yeah. And uh, I was talking to a friend last night about the need for community. And I was wondering why that doesn't filter through for some people. And yeah. I don't know if it's a conditioning thing yeah. or if some folks are really just lone wolves. I feel like yeah. the need to connect with other It is people. in us and it's at war with the whole mythology of the hero's journey. Right? Like Joseph Campbell, a hero with a thousand faces. It's half of the stories we consume are the hero's journey. And as a writer, I tell you, like the hero's journey, the hero is at their weakest when they are in community. They're at their weakest when they're devoting their time to slowing down for a man or a woman, whatever. That's stasis, that's death. They cannot have their big epiphany. They cannot find their self-reliance. They cannot find their transformative power unless they go it out on their own and battle evil and find the lesson within themselves. And they do it alone. And that's what we consume. It's right. at war. It's at war with who we are. And there's this other thing called the heroine's journey, which no one talks about, which is the exact opposite. Danger for them is when they're alone. Whether it's male or female, that's this, those types of stories, you'll see it. When they're alone, they're in danger. And they find strength in groups and community. And we view that as less. It's romance novels. There's plenty wrong with romance novels that are out there that get consumed for the most part. And I've edited a few. Um, <laughs> but it's treated as romance is less than. It's not serious fiction. Comedies are usually heroines' journeys. They're also treated as less than. Sure. You know, we celebrate the hero. The brave heart, the gladiator. And we, and we hold as less than the heroine. Yeah. And that's a reflection of how we want to view ourselves, right? I want to go and have a successful career. I want status. I want that job title. You know, I want to be a best selling author, Mike. I want to have recognition. Or I want to be a rock star, you know, right. Like, right. you know, we celebrate them. But in our favorite groups, we usually talk about the singer, but it was a group that did the thing. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. You know, no man is an island. Yeah. And this is, this is a famous saying. You do a really good job at articulating things like Thank that. Thank you. You know, I, I think about it because I want to do valuable things with my time that actually benefit people as well as myself. And so if I'm going to write stories, I want to consciously write stories. I want to be subversive. I want to support the values that I think showcase values that are important to us surviving <laughs> and thriving. Indeed. Um, yeah. Indeed. I want to be conscious of your time. It's refreshing to let go and not have hold the agenda. Yeah. Honestly, and I'm not trying to promote anything. I have things to promote, but it's not why I'm talking to you today. And I, will, I like you a lot. I'm happy to have joined the pantheon of, of generally non toxic guests that you've had. They've been 98% I, I, non toxic. Yeah. I mean, that's how, yeah. that's how you do it, you know. Yeah. I interviewed one person on my podcast, you know, just one who was like, I had no struggles, I had no fears. I'm just impossible. Perfect. Impossible. I know it's just you know, but those are, a, those are the people who have influence. That would be a challenge for me to try to like pick that person apart. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's that, not worth it. It's, and you're right; you are absolutely right. It's not. Yeah, worth it. you know, I I think the thing that I would talk about that's present for me personally because at some point I realized I value tribe and this idea of tribe and recognize that I don't have much tribe like as a past tense state 
feeling like I didn't want to be in the communities I was in. They weren't meeting my needs and I wanted to actively choose my community, right? Based on valuing things like community and authenticity and building trust and consent and spaces where it can fully show up and everybody fully shows up without it being some sort of big gate or hoop to walk through. That's what I want, right? And these last two years have been such a challenge because I, I, like you, I have eclectic interests and I wear all these hats and I have communities from everything I do and tribes. And some of that's from music, some of it's from author communities, some of it's from I taught yoga for a few years, I life coach. And it's been a challenge to not be able to be physically in community, but also mm. to recognize the assumptions that I made with the communities that I'm in, right? In terms of those values, right? We're seeing such fractures in our communities everywhere. Everybody's encountering, they've got people who are pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine. They've sure. got people who are Black Lives Matter, but don't have Black friends or Black Lives Matter, but don't talk about it ever and don't do anything versus people who say, hey, you know, law and order, you should just follow the law. You won't get in trouble. And it turns out that these dichotomies are present at like this, almost the same proportions as like voting in this country. <laughs> like it's really split and, and that bothers me a lot. It bothers me a lot because do you talk about the yoga thing, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, which we could talk about appropriation and titles and terms, but I, I appreciate the spirit of the word yoga the yoke just to connect and the idea that for connection you're connecting to your true self you're also connecting to others around you right and um, i feel like as a culture we've evolved have been evolving to this really good place where we are better able to connect with our true selves and we value that right that we value our emotional well-being that's sure. cool that's absolutely cool but what we don't have seem to value is that connection with others because what i see is that there's premium value on preserving my emotional well-being and the shortcut to doing that is to ignore our shared reality which is not yoga we can't ignore our shared reality, which like, let's say with COVID, people are dying. Right. People, when they wear masks, they don't get sick. Right. I can objectively say for the last two years, I have not gotten sick once. Holy shit. That's amazing. I've it never is. had that. That's amazing. But so there's the sh there's shared reality and people I know and love and respect are denying the very fabric of, of our shared reality to preserve their own emotional well-being and identity. And that just, it saddens me, it angers me, it makes me afraid for our future. You know, like, like these are the enlightened circles. And they're not any better. They're not any better objectively. Sure. Or, than, or safer than any other spaces. The question then becomes, how do you, or do you mm -hmm. still incorporate these people into your life? I, again, speaking to my experience, I have dealt with people who are, whether they're anti-vaxxers or they're sort of closet racists or, mm -hmm. you know, homophobes or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, I, and I've been very guilty of at first inkling that something's not kosher in that realm, just being like, okay, bye. I, yeah. I, I can't stick around for this. Yeah. And I remember having, speaking to somebody and, and recording it for this podcast, and they were talking about their family members who are 
I guess maybe a little bit racist. Hmm. Or they were, they were a, a little bit Trumpy, which I mean is kind of synonymous, <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean. Who are a bit conservative, yeah. to, to be nice about it. Yeah. And they're like, you know, these are the people that I grew up with. This is my family. I still want to have Thanksgiving dinner with them, yeah. even if we don't see eye to eye. Yeah. And I guess there's a part of me that feels like, okay, I understand that. But at the same time, when what you believe in diminishes either someone's identity or someone's health yeah i don't know if i could stand behind that silently there's an argument that i want to stay neutral i want to be bridged with everybody and so the way i'm going to do that is to not challenge people's emotional space and we're talking about emotional security versus emotional wellness. I don't want this person to be upset, right? Because we're going to be upset about any number of things that challenge us. I'm upset plenty of times. And then after that, it's this beautiful moment where it's like, I can analyze why was I upset and think about it. And if people aren't challenged, they don't get to have that. But there's this equiv false equivocation of this person's emotional well-being, meaning or emotional comfort is equally important to somebody else's physical safety and physical well-being. I hear all too often, and this was the status quo for that I grew up in, that was the equivocation was this is equally important. This person's emotional well-being, their emotional, their ego is equally important to this other person's physical well-being. And that's what it means to be moderate. And that bothers me. Right. And I'm so blessed to have this great relationship with my wife and to be able to appreciate how we're the same and where we're different. And, you know, I'm a little more like you, Mike. Like, I've gotten so good over the years at filtering out people just based on on values or how they show up you know I, I don't i haven't historically it's like an exception when i should learning to show up in a space and fully be me right it, it is like such a big thing and but that doesn't mean that i have to not have boundaries right with with people Right. And so I'm very good now at setting boundaries and having boundaries. And, and I'm still end up defaulting towards being the hero, the lone wolf. <laughs> My wife, she's got all these people, you know, she's got these beautiful relationships and they're all over the place. I'm not saying all over the political spectrum, but all over the place in terms of balance where they're at. She doesn't discard people easily at all and it's like there's part of me that wants to say hey just you know great you have the boundary you know what you need you know just hold it and another part it's like kind of an awe it's like it's this community thing the heroin right yep. like and i don't have an answer like i don't like, yeah, i don't yeah. know i i don't but i would not i know for me I would not have that Thanksgiving. No this is for me. No way. I wouldn't do it. You know, like I can have friends who are cops, but I can also recognize that anyone who's a cop who's in the conversation is not acknowledging the basics of how the how policing in the United States started and the roots and origins. Like, I don't understand why that can't, we can't have a common starting place, shared reality. I can't understand why we can't start there. We can disagree sure. about things, but if we can't agree on reality, we can't start to have a conversation. So I only engage with people where we can have a shared reality. And maybe that's my filter now. And I think that is that, a good filter. I can't have. do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good filter to have. I think it saves you from saves you from banging your head against the wall. Yeah, but 
but it's disappointing mike i've it had is. to let go Super i've had to let go of communities yep. over this yep, in the last same. couple of years and so i'm in transition again i don't you know I, there is no ready-made tailor-made like community for that can, even if i love i love the queer communities i find the most safety in queer spaces i'm not even queer like because there's so much authenticity but there's still the unreality thing that pokes into it absolutely you know absolutely yeah. i mean yeah. i think it, ultimately it just comes down to building ethan's community and pulling yeah, yeah. you know whoever is your tribe from there and yeah. and that's what i do and and it's it's slow and it takes labor emotional labor yes, and does. time and time and time yes it does yeah and there it is we're there it always is. always cup half full community is an ever-evolving concept as we grow hopefully we discover how much value community has in our lives personally i think it has tremendous value and it might even be the single most important thing in my life we also sometimes discover that parts of our community are in flux because we change or others change or we become privy to certain aspects of people that we may not have previously been privy to. Over the last five or so years, between the elections and COVID-19 and everything else happening in the socio-political climate, especially here in the United States, I think a lot of folks have experienced what you might call communal tumult. It can be jarring, and the feeling that comes when someone that you've embraced as family no longer fits that construct uh, can be kind of crazy to think about, and it might cause you to even think different things about yourself, but it's something we're going to have to accept and deal with in order to progress as humanity. Uh, I appreciate Ethan's honesty in discussing the struggles that he's had finding and cultivating and keeping a tribe, and I wish him the best in success in adding to that tribe, and hopefully I'm a part of that now. Thank you very much to Ethan for taking the time to chat. Uh, you can keep tabs on him by going to ethanfreckleton.com. That is E-T-H-A-N-F-R-E-C-K-L-E-T-O-N.com. Or follow him on his Instagram, which he keeps threatening to delete, but I hope he doesn't, at Ethan Freckleton. He's there on IG. And uh, thanks again, Ethan, for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to this episode. We really hope that you stick around and listen to future episodes or past episodes if you feel so inclined. You can obviously listen to Detoxicity on the podcast platform of your choosing. And if you want to get in touch with me, please hit me up on Instagram at DetoxPodGuy, Twitter, TizMikeJoseph, or you can email me at DetoxPod at gmail.com. Always willing to hear constructive criticism, thoughts, ideas, Real, realizations and if you yourself would like to be a guest on the show or you know somebody who would make a good guest i will take recommendations from now until the end of time so please feel free to reach out to me i want to thank a couple of people who've been very important to this show uh, calvin williams composed the music that you hear at the beginning and end of every episode jacob block composed the logo or created the logo for the show and i want to give a special shout out to andrew grossman and jeff giles for providing inspiration for me to come up with this idea and bring it to fruition once again thank you all for listening i really really appreciate it and take care of yourselves peace